Matthias Hegecio, this is a great island picture for me to introduce our distinguished guest, Professor Andres Kloses from Austria. Now he's working as the head of section of rheumatology in the sports imaging department of radiology, Medical University, Innsbruck, Austria. This is my first time to meet Professor Krauser, but I heard her name so long time ago from the, her publication scientific article, especially in the ESO graphic and the nerves. He has published over 117 peer review articles and contributed around 20 book chapter. Her interest in focus on the musculoskeletal image of rheumatologists and sport, also saw conscious media, also saw guided intervention, esography, and the new ultrasound technology. Today, he was talking about the ultrasound hand and elbow, nerve entrainment. I believe her speech will give us a wonderful inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big welcome to Professor Krauses. Thank you, Professor Wu, for, Wang, for the very nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Wang and uh, Professor Wu, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. So my topic is nerve entrapment syndromes. As we all know, they have uh, typical clinical presentations and a typical electrophysiologic physiology, which can determine the level and the type of the lesion. And furthermore, imaging is used to evaluate the cause of the entrapment, the severity, and also the etiology. Why is ultrasound used? Ultrasound is very helpful because it can be examined the nerve over the entire long course to determine the level of the entrapment. And then, if needed, you can also use a dedicated uh, magnetic resonance imaging study. But ultrasound is still the best to do a dynamic assessment. That means we can assess everything under an active and passive examination and under, for example, flexion for the uh, ulnar nerve at the elbow. Then ultrasound can very easily do a side-to-side -side comparison, what is also difficult to obtain by MRI investigation. And then finally, ultrasound is also helpful to do some palpation. That means you can localize the area of pain of the patient with a transducer. So generally, nerve reactions to compression have uh, some common features. There is an irritation of the perineum and the intraneural uh, vascularity can result in a hypervascularity as seen in this median nerve. Compression of the vasa nervorum and the uh, results in a venous congestion, and this results in an edema which can be seen by uh, loss of echogenicity in the nerve. In chronic stages, there are some fibrotic changes in the nerve and around the nerve, uh, making some uh, increased echogenicity in the nerve. And then we can also see the level of the compression, as this is the normal size, then you have the level of the compression and then the swelling. And finally, there is also a loss of the fascicular echotecture due to the edema. So the carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common entrapping neuropathy with a prevalence of 2%. Uh, women are affected three to five times more often and it results in the typical clinical presentation. What I would like to point your attention to is we can see here the retinaculum flexorum, which is typically bulging over the bony landmarks. And interestingly, in long uh, conditions, we can see that there is a huge irregularity of the median nerve with a very bizarre presentation. And here is a measurement, a cross-sectional area measurement uh, obtained in the carpal tunnel. And uh, what is very helpful is to do a comparison to a more proximal located measurement 
we can use our anatomic landmark, or this is the pronata quadratus muscle, and then you make a difference between the most uh, enlarged cross-sectional area measurement in the carpal tunnel compared to the proximal measurement. And here um, there is a cutoff of 2 or 2.5 square millimeters, what has been shown to, ver to be very helpful in the diagnosis of CTS. And this delta allows also for a severe degrading, uh, which has shown to be less than 6 square millimeters in mild carpal tunnel syndrome. In moderate, it is equal or less than 9, and in severe stages, it is more than 9 square millimeters. So I think it's very helpful always to take an upper measurement and then to compare this measurement also for other nerves to the maximum thickening at the entrapment level. There are some hints we have to think about, like the inverted notch sign. Uh, so this is the median nerve in the long course, that's the proximal level of the carpal tunnel. And finally, it might happen that the swelling is located on the very distal level, so we have to scan the carpal tunnel all over the different parts. Like to show you a movie, here's the median nerve and the retinaculum flexorum, and coming with the probe more distally, we can see that finally there is a distal enlargement sorry again, of the median nerve, which should be used to obtain the measurements. And then there's another anatomical variation, like a bifid median nerve with the median artery. And in these cases, we take both square, uh, 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 square measurements and we add them together. And here the cutoff is four square millimeters. So mostly CTS is idiopathic, however, in many cases ultrasound can demonstrate the different causes of the nerve compression. There might be a thickening of the flexor retinaculum due to different uh, causes like osteoarthritis or mechanical overuse. Here you can see the bulging of the uh, retinaculum and a bulging of more than 2 millimeters has been described to be indicative for CTS. There might be an increase in carpal tunnel content like due to ganglenses coming mainly from the radiocarpal joint or due to tumors. Then the, often there is some tenosynovitis present. Here you can see tenosynovitis around the flexor tendons of the second and third finger flexor. Then there might be a deposition of crystals like gout or amyloid. And then often we do have this radiocarpal synovitis, which should also be treated if you inject the carpal tunnel. We should also treat the synovitis because it increases the volume in the carpal tunnel. And this was an interesting case. We can see here the middle nerve and adjacent, sorry, and adjacent echogenic structure, which could also be mistaken for a flexor tendon. And then um, it has been shown that there's a fatty structure by using MR. This is a T2-weighted sequence, and this is a fat-suppressed sequence. And then we can nicely see that this structure is a small white boma. I'd like to show you a video. Here you can see the median nerve then coming up the small white boma, and then it's going away again, which makes the differential diagnosis to a normal flexor tendon more easily to observe. Well, finally, there might be also the presence of anomalous muscles like uh, variations in the palmaris longus, in the palmaris profundus, or proximal region of the lumbar calus, or also what we have recently found are the gastric flexor digitorum superficialis for the second finger. So here you can see uh, the median nerve then the second finger flexor and adjacent a strange muscle, which was this uh, uh, abnormality. And here you can see how, how the insertion goes very distally on the second finger. And this is the moving accordingly, a huge muscle belly, 
the enclosed the tendon coming down and then you can see the coincidence is the median nerve and the muscle leading to the carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms. Well, at the wrist, uh, there might be also affection of the valmar cutaneous branch, uh, showing a sensory deficit of the palmar triangle in the tenor eminence. Here we can see nicely the medium nerve and close adjacent the palmar cutaneous branch, which is always located close to the flexor carpi radialis tendon, but it is very variable in the origin. It might be affected after carpal tunnel release, after resection of ventral ganglia or due to bandage, for example, if the patient wears uh, heavy watches or jewelry. And what we can see by sonography is a focal hyperechoic nerve swelling at the fascial crossing. Here you can see the median nerve and the enlarged hyperechoic thickening close to the flexor carpi radialis tendon of this palmar cutaneous branch. And this is somewhat uh, a little bit difficult to see because there's a lot of scar tissue after CTS operation around this entrapped very small nerve. And very similar here we can see that it's a tiny nerve which becomes bigger at the level of the entrapment due to scar tissue. Here a movie showing that this is a very small nerve, it's going to be increased at the area of the entrapment. So at the time there might be also an affection of the recurrent motor branch which has been described as to be rare in the literature but maybe it's also only underdiagnosed. This is due to an excessive angle of this branch at the distal edge of the retinaculum and there are some uh, anomalous uh, courses like uh, it is going to the retinaculum or under the retinaculum and so therefore it might be a challenge for the surgeon or also in the endoscopic surgery and it has been named the one million dollar nerve because if it's affected it causes a lot of problems. There might be also the incidence of schwannomas, ganglia, or in long distance a cycling, a sportsman, or of course due to cutting injuries. And even the carpal tunnel syndrome might be uh, going together with an involvement of this recurrent motor branch, and uh, then it is very suitable uh, to inject also this small nerve. Here we can see how it might appear in a long-standing uh, situation with all the atrophy of the tenor muscles compared to the other side where the tenor muscles are nicely preserved. So moving to the pulmonary nerve at the wrist, uh, also this has been described to be uncommon to rare. It presents always typical paresthesias of the fourth and the fifth finger. And uh, also here, a delta cross-sectional area measurement is very helpful. That means we take the maximum of the cross-sectional area measurement at the Guillaume's canal, which here shows 9 square millimeters. And then more proximally from it, then uh, it shows 5 square millimeters, so it's quite double so thick. And here we can see uh, close to the pisiform a ganglion, which compresses the ulnar nerve close to the ulnar artery. Etiology might be also extrinsic to thrombosis or aneurysm of the uh, artery, especially found in bicyclists, golf or record sports. Then uh, there is also the hypotenor hammer syndrome uh, with repetitive trauma against the hook of the hemate which can involve the ulnar nerve as well. And then there are different space occupying lesions like lipomas, varices, pseudoaneurysm, ganglion formation and accessory muscles like an accessory abducted due to minimum muscle. So there has been recently done also some nice work about the deep branch of the ulnar nerve 
which divides just proximal to the Guillaume Canal uh, within it, and there might be a classical isolated lesion like the type 2 uh, Guillaume Canal syndrome entrapment. It can be due to ganglionsis or trauma, due to bicycling or vibratory tools like the jackhammers. And there are several anatomic variations as well. Here are some images from this publication showing that these nerves can be nicely differentiated and of course they can be also diagnosed if in trap. Coming to the radial nerve at the level of the wrist, this is the so-called Wartenberg syndrome. It uh, affects the superficial branch of the radial nerve and it results in pain, numbness and paresthesias along the radial side of the wrist and the thumb. Mainly it is affected after surgery, uh, after decompression of the first extensive compartment or also after intravenous cannulation or again due to external compression uh, of uh, watches and jewelry. It results in a nerve swelling and in a loss of normal fascicular architecture of this very small nerve. We can see here the typical location and presentation. So this is the first extensor compartment with the abductor pollicis longus tendon and the extensor pollicis brevis tendon. They are enhanced by the retinaculum and close by there is this uh, small nerve, the superficial radial nerve, which goes with the cephalic brain. And here we can see the nerve going over the first extensor compartment with all the scar tissue after surgery of this uh, extensor compartment. And here we can see in the longitudinal scan uh, this tiny nerve which increases to, uh, to a neuroma after a surgery. Differential diagnosis for these syndromes are decurvenous tenosynovitis or also osteoarthritis of the trapezium metacarpal joint or even the proximal intersection syndrome what affects the first and second extensor compartment. So this is a rather an, a rare condition as well. It's an isolated lesion of the posterior interosseous branch of the radial, radial nerve, sorry, which uh, provides the inner ver version of the dorsal wrist joint. And here you can see the close uh, vicinity to the extensor compartment, or the extensor compartment with the nerve, and this nerve goes uh, towards the radiocarpal joint. It can be affected due to a radiocarpal ganglia to after the cannulation of the cephalic vein or due to wrist overuse and osteoarthritis. So moving up to the elbow, the second most common nerve entrapment of the upper extremity is the cubital tunnel syndrome with an incidence of up to 25 cases per hundred in the population. It results with pain and paresthesia and numbness and weakness in the fifth and in the fourth finger and chronically it leads to claw deformities. Patients at risk of truck drivers which means again the open window with the flexed elbow or cell phone users. And what we nicely see using, by, uh, using sonography is that by elbow flexion uh, um, increased pressure in the cubital tunnel results. So therefore, always, if we look at to the ulnar nerve, the cubital tunnel, we should also use the extended and the flexed position. So here we can see the olecranon and close by the ulnar nerve. And what uh, else can be seen is an osteophyte. And we can imagine if this nerve goes over the osteophyte. Uh, when there's a tendency for subluxation, of course, this osteophyte can irritate the nerve very much. And this is a condition showing how the nerve snaps over the olecranon and the osteophyte, and finally the nerve is uh, completely at another location than it should be, it should be immediately, and then it snaps up towards the lateral side. Here you can see how the nerve snaps, and then we have a second snap, of the medial triceps head 
which can be also present uh, in such a condition. So therefore, dynamic sonography under flexion and extension is very helpful and sometimes it might be also needed to do a resistive extension and flexion. This situation leads to a friction uretus. Uh, there might be also an absence of the cubital tunnel retinaculum or a laxity of the arcuate ligament or a very shallow epicondylar groove which makes the ulnar nerve instable. So there have been reported some cut of values like 10 square millimeters or also this cubital humeral nerve area ratio which uh, is over 1.4 in cases of cubital tonal syndrome. However, at this uh, level it is uh, very important to look at structural changes that means an increased epigenic rim around the nerve or a fascicle swelling because um, these cut-offs are not always helpful. And finally, there might be also a compression at the more distal level of the elbow, at the level of the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. Here you can see the ulnar uh, and the humeral head, and here the nerve in between <coughs> with this uh, fascicle swelling. There might be also the presence of external compression due to bony fragments, loose bodies which are very found very often in the elbow, bony spurs as we have already seen, and space occupying lesions like tumors and ganglia coming from the oh. So there might be also the presence of some ganglia which can affect the ulnar nerve or some accessory muscles and this Ancranius epitrochlearis is uh, uh, found relatively often. So here you can see Sorry, it should work, but... So this uh, Anconeus epitrochlearis at the Guillaume, uh, at the ulnar nerve, at the elbow, is found relatively often and can be nicely identified lying over the nerve. 
So I will now move to the Pronaker syndrome, which is a mimicker of uh, the carpal tunnel syndrome. It can take place at four levels. Distally at the hu humerus, it is caused due to the ligament of struthus, which is a very rare anatomical variant which comes from the supracondylophrosis to the medial humeral epicondyle. And here, radiography is very helpful uh, to uh, see this bony spur. Then at the proximal elbow, uh, this occurs due to the biceps brachii involvement, uh, which can be caused uh, by trauma, overuse, or a radial bursitis, or uh, if a hematoma is present. And uh, what is interesting to see that there's a close venicity of the median nerve at that level with the brachial artery and the biceps tendon, what in this case shows some effusion and synovitis. And if we move in the longi uh, more distally, we can see here this echogenic rim around the median nerve close to the artery and the biceps. And coming even more distally with the probe, we can see that this hematoma is uh, clearly affecting the median nerve at this level. And then finally, it might also take place at the proximal forearm with a thickening of the proximal edge of the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle, uh, a fibrous band between the pronator tears and the superficial flexors. The anterior interosseous nerve syndrome affects the motor nerve of the medium nerve and results in a motor deficiency that the patients cannot make the OK sign. And here we can see this nerve very nicely between the deep and the superficial flexors. And this can result in a muscle atrophy, as we can see here. <coughs> typically of the flexor pollicis longus muscle and the radial part of the profundus flexors and the index finger and the pronator quadratus muscle. Here we can see the close sinicity to the artery of this nerve branch. So the radial tunnel syndrome or the sacred supinatal syndrome uh, presents this tenderness and pain at the proximal forearm, which can be a mimicker of uh, lateral epicondylitis because it can present with or without motor weakness. And what we can see is an enlargement at the compression side with or without uh, hypoechoic changes. It is a very small nerve. There have been described some normal cross-sectional area measurement values of the humeral shaft and the supinator. However, I think the morphology is very important to look at and to check there the enlargement of the entrapment can be seen. So this is a nice case showing the typical focal enlargement of this small nerve at the level of the supinator. And here we can see uh, um, the nerve coming down with a focal swelling and then a more pronounced focal swelling at this level here in uh, the uh, radial tunnel. It can uh, be due to a repetitive pronation and supination or flexion or extension of the arm. And I'd like to show you a video. We can see here the radial nerve coming down and then it becomes smaller as it should be so the focal enlargement can be nicely seen being present at the more proximal level but however there are also more distal levels which uh, can be encountered so if we move the probe more distally we can see here the swelling the etiology may also the so-called leash of Henry, which is a crossing branch of the recurrent radial artery or a thickened edge of the extensor carporadalis bravis muscle or space occupying lesions like ganglia and the bicipital radial bursitis. So here we can see nicely a huge ganglion with the uh, radial nerve on top of the ganglion 
and I like always to perform also MRI because uh, just to know where the origin of this ganglion is, if it's really coming from the joint, because then maybe you have also to treat the joint and here the corresponding image showing the same detection reserved normal nerve, but just only the snapping what uh, is helpful for the diagnosis. Here we can see such a relatively normal uh, nerve and then it's going over uh, the medial epicondyle during the flexion of the elbow. <coughs> in chronic stages there might be also some fibrotic spots in the nerve itself as we can see here at the genic spots or even here uh, what uh, already tells us that this is a chronic stage of enchantment. And then, of course, also the atrophy of the related nerve might, of the related muscles might be present, but this is not always easy to assess by ultrasound. So, what about ultrasound guided therapies? The indications are entrapment syndromes or adhesions. Accessory muscles, ganglion cyst formation, postraumatic hematomas, and postraumatic nerve stretching. We do have a therapeutic injection, uh, mainly dealing with corticosteroids and anesthetics, for example, by using the germ cinnamon, uh, uh, relatively low doses of 2.5 mg can be used and the dexamethasone accordingly. This is to hide or dissect the perineurum as we have already very nicely seen in the talk before. Then uh, it is used to distend the gliding layer of the nerve. And finally, of course, the anesthetics are also used to better verify the needle tip location. And this injection can be also performed uh, at a so-called diagnostic level, just to check the pain response after the injection. Here the volume generally is a little bit higher and you can use also uh, thinner needles uh, up to 27 gauge. So the patient should be placed in a relaxed position, the transfuser is positioned easily and longitudinally and we check a Doppler if there are some vessels around just in order not to hit the vessels and then we do an in and out plane a position of the needle and this should be done uh, around the nerve in order to cover uh, the whole nerve um, uh, in order to cover the whole nerve and to do a good hydrodissection. This uh, at the end, uh, I think it was uh, very nicely shown in the talk before, just uh, the fluid should move around the whole nerve. So my last slides are only dealing uh, about the evidence of these ultrasound guided injections. I hope that I uh, will make it. Um, we have to say even these um, treatments are, I think also here in this department are often used because they are uh, working very good and very nicely, the evidence is rather low. We do have some evidence for CTS, but uh, uh, this is also only on the short term. In the short term we can see that there is a level of evidence one that ultrasound guided injections are helpful, but um, <coughs> in the long term uh, studies are still uh, missing. And finally, they are not necessarily superior to patient guided in the long term. So uh, the results on that are still very uh, low. And uh, even lower, this is in regard to the sulcus nervi ulnaris syndrome, which uh, can uh, give a level of evidence to only because there are only one randomized uh, trial about that available. So uh, to summarize, um, we have very nice experiences with ultrasound guided injections if you have a proper diagnosis and uh, as I've seen all the literature and the publication of uh, this department here, I think you are also doing a lot of this injection and I'm looking forward to have better literature about that in order that we can also approve that uh, scientifically. Thank you very much for your attention. So